Okay, so it looks like we've got a lot of people here today. Thank you for joining us. If anybody else wants to jump on along the way, we will welcome them in. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us here today. My name is Rennie and I'm a counselor at AGI. If you're joining us for the first time, AGI or Alzheimer Group, we are an organization that supports people who are living with dementia and those who support them. We do that through programming for people living with dementia and through counseling and support groups for caregivers, as well as education like this lecture today. Um, today's lecture is being made possible through the generous support of the Lindsay Memorial Foundation. AGI is a charitable organization and we rely on the support of donations. Today's lecture is free, but you are welcome to donate at any time by calling us or visiting our website. And if you don't have it already, our contact information will be sent to you by email. Um, we do have a couple other educational programs coming up this month. We have another Lindsay lecture like this one happening in exactly two weeks time. Um, and that is a mindfulness approach to caregiving. And we will also be offering our Alzheimer 101 course online later this month. Um, just a couple housekeeping items before we begin today's lecture. Uh, as I asked already, please keep yourself on mute throughout the lecture. We do have a lot of people today and just want to reduce any, any background noise that's going on. Um, you will have an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the lecture. Um, if you have a question that comes to your mind during the course of the lecture, please put it in the chat. You can see the chat function. It's at the bottom of your screen. Um, and you can type that in a message. You can type it to me, or if you are comfortable with everybody seeing, you can type it to everyone. Um, and I will be reading out those questions at the end of the lecture. So at any point you can, you can send your question in and we'll get to it at the end. So uh, please keep yourself on mute. And as well, we understand, you know, some of you may be at home with somebody who you're caring for. And if you need to step out, if you need to jump off the lecture at any time, we absolutely understand that. So without further ado, let's get started with today's lecture. I'd like to introduce my colleague, Megan Williams. She is our AGI Director of Support Services, and she will be guiding us today through supporting someone living with dementia. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Rennie. Um, everyone can hear me okay. So I am, as Rennie said, uh, Megan Williams. I am uh, in charge of the programs at Alzheimer Group. Um, uh, we're here today to talk about how to support someone living with dementia. Um, are you helping someone with dementia? Um, are you here because you're a primary caregiver and you don't know whether or not you're doing a good enough job, uh, even though you're, that you're trying the best you can? Um, is there anything more you can do to help your best friend, your wife, your husband, your sister, your brother? So I'm happy to have all of you here today because being a caregiver is so important. Even if you doubt what you're doing is a good job, you are making a difference. Just by being here, constantly trying to improve your role as a caregiver, uh, as a spouse, shows so much dedication um, and how you're trying to improve the quality of life uh, for the person you're caring for. I want to just let you know that this talk is not specifically about supporting someone uh, in a specific task, rather than how to instill a positive approach uh, when you're caring for someone living with dementia. Honey, it's not moving. Wait. Your, your screen share is not moving? Yeah, let me just see. Okay, try for um, an arrow at the at the bottom of your screen. Yeah, it's not moving. Hold on, maybe I'll click it. No. If you oh, there you go. We we you've moved. Oh, there we go. Okay, we'll try it. So today, um, we're going to talk about the reality of being a caregiver, um, trying to understand the person living with dementia and what some of their limitations might be. Um, as well as touching upon some of the guidelines uh, for what we call a person-centered approach, which is something that we will uh, discuss further on. Let's see if it works okay. So today I just want to, for you to reflect on who you're caring for. Um, if you could, if you feel comfortable, um, 
you can close your eyes and picture that person. Maybe you have a picture of you on vacation. Maybe it's your wedding. Maybe it's the last gathering that you had with friends or family. Now I want you to think about what you like about this person. What makes you proud of the person? Is it their demeanor? Is it their zest for life? Their attention to detail? Their ability to make a fantastic meal or barbecue? We often hear about the person being lost or gone, but rather than focus on, on letting go of who the person was, is it possible that you can reshape or reconfigure that relationship of, that you currently have with a person and continue a bond or a connection and also form new ones? This is all part of grief work when you're trying new roles and caring for someone you love. So I must talk about changing of the relationships. Um, before we start talking about how to support someone, because you have to acknowledge that your relationship with that person has changed uh, as well as the person you're caring for. So very often when you in dementia care or work, we talk about a term called ambiguous loss. Now this term is something that we use to define a type of loss that you feel when a person with dementia is physically there, but might emotionally or mentally may not be present in the same way as before. It's a different from the loss or the grief that you might experience when a person has died. And very often, um, because it's because closure is not necessarily possible. And the grief cannot be fully resolved when the person is still living. Very often this type of loss is not acknowledged amongst your family or friends because they don't know what it's like to live this in this ambiguity. Lots of mixed feelings stir up, um, but they are actually very common amongst caregivers. With Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementia, so small multiple losses accumulate over time. Just something like not being able to work the microwave or turn on the TV, that's a loss. For yourselves, not being able to um, plan your retirement or the future of, of how you envisioned you would live um, once retirement happened, that's also a loss. There's also something called anticipatory grief where you're, it's a reaction that you're constantly grieving, uh, thinking about the losses that might come about. So, Understanding and recognizing the loss of, of roles, the new added responsibilities um, can seem quite overwhelming, but it's all important to reflect on your own self, your own purpose of life and, and meaning of life. So wouldn't the world be a better place if everybody just thought the way that I do. I think we can all relate to this. Um, what if, wouldn't it be easier if everyone around us just did what we asked without questions? But the problem is that we don't see to eye to eye with everyone. And while we might be thinking um, that we wish the person living with dementia would do, do a certain way or do th things that we want them to do in a certain way, they're probably thinking the same thing. They want us to do the way that they're thinking. So what happens is that it ends up being in a conflict. Um, and the, the only way that you can really change this, and it, it's a really hard concept to grasp, is that you need to be willing to let go and be the listener first. This is very hard, especially in relationships, where you've constantly had the banter back and forth. Um, you've always been maybe sarcastic or you always had to have your word uh, last uh, in an argument. But the reality is that you need to let go 
and be the listener first and maybe put the needs of the person living with dementia first. This is called the person-centered approach. It's important to keep in mind the person living with the dementia, what their values are, what their beliefs are, treating them with respect and with dignity. We have to put ourselves in their shoes and understand uh, things from their history, their preferences, their likes and their dislikes. It's often easier said than done, but it's one step at a time. So how has the person living with dementia changed since the diagnosis? Does the person have any insight to, as to what is happening with them? Do they have partial insight where they might say that they're not feeling um, well or that things are fuzzy or cloudy? Um, are they withdrawn because they're afraid of making mistakes? Um, we have to think about what the person living with dementia, what has been taken away from them. This might include not being able to control finances, might not be able to drive anymore, to have choices, maybe choices where they live, um, who they can talk to, how they can communicate. So very often we see these changes in, in the way that they express themselves. The person might become clingy, might become anxious, agitated, angry, sad, and depressed. So what are a person's challenges? This is just a very brief overview um, to put in context of how to support someone living with dementia. So we have a person might become forgetful, so their short-term memory um, is compromised uh, before their long-term memory, so things that they recently did. Um, they might become repetitive, constantly asking you, um, is someone coming over? Is, uh, what, when is the person calling me back? Or where are we going? Um, to confused or disoriented to time, to place, to person. Um, the person might not be able to conceptualize future events. Um, they might be getting ready to, uh, for a doctor's appointment that is only a week from now um, because you told them and that they're disoriented to time. Um, poor judgment. Reasoning. Um, they might not be able to, they might not dress the same way. So on a winter's day, they might go outside because they see that it's sunny um, and they're dressed in a t-shirt because they associate the sun with warmth. Um, lack of initiative. This happens often where a person might have had so many interests such as doing puzzles or crosswords, even watching TV. But when you leave them alone, they just sit there staring outside at the window, out of the window. Um, but they might seem very content. Um, having someone, bes uh, having to be beside someone every step in the care. This is a, a challenge for caregivers because they, the person living with dementia always needs the reassurance as in what comes next, where are we going? Um, what are we doing? Um, the inability to uh, understand your reasoning and your, your logic. Why do you need to put things a certain way? Why are there certain steps that you have to do? Um, resistant to care. Very often resistance to care is a problem in communication. They might not understand what you're asking them to do. Um, and unpredictable changes. We all know that every day could look very different. Um, and that's a challenge for the person because they can't conceptualize what's happening tomorrow um, and also for the caregiver. So when we talk about strategies for more successful interactions, um, there are guiding principles. Uh, these are guiding principles that are gonna help you put in place, um, putting the person's interests um, and needs uh, first. So
So some examples that you might want to highlight um, would be their individuality, their independence, um, their ability to make choices, um, respecting their rights and their dignity. Um, so I asked you how the person living with dementia has changed or how do you think about it? Um, but what's really hard for some people is to understand what still remains constant for them. What are they good at? Um, what are they capable of doing? So an example of this might be the person used to be a wonderful cook. They would create um, wonderful meals and, and bring them to you uh, after long days at work. But the person has a hard time conceptualizing what to make, um, where the ingredients are, um, and how to cook them. But what the person's still able to really do well is they're able to um, peel those carrots and potatoes and, and chop the vegetables and, and know just right how to maybe barbecue or make that perfect burger as well. So as much as a person might have a hard time with the whole picture, they're still able to do something. And if you start to look at what they're still able to do, uh, you're on the road to success. So I talked, a, a, I mentioned this a little bit, but the first thing you can do is step into the person's world. Um, so let's just imagine for a second um, that you're sitting at a table after dinner and the person living with dementia says, when are we gonna eat? We have to think about what they see. Well, they see the empty plate in front of them they hear they might hear someone else you know clanging some dishes uh, what they understand of the situation while well, they're in the kitchen so what do you do in the kitchen you might eat um, what they smell they just smelt the the aroma from the meal that that was just prepared and also what the person needs so when you think of go back to the example of someone sitting in front of their plate after dinner, asking them when they're gonna eat next, we have to understand what their senses are experiencing um, and maybe as a care partner, give them better clues. So after the meal, we remove the plate and we go into another room. Then you might not have that question being asked. Another uh, way for successful interactions, um, again, it's asking the caregiver to, to make changes, is to accept. Accept the diagnosis. Accept that the person living with you um, or the person you love is different. And that what you're going to experience is a new way of life. Very often people talk about acceptance and, and they don't really understand what it means. Understand that it's part of the grieving process, but it doesn't need, mean that you need to like the situation. It's about acknowledging what's happening and figuring out how you can best live with it, how you can adapt to what's happening. So, it's very difficult, especially at the beginning stages, when someone says, when your role as a caregiver is to really take charge, maybe you're responsible for setting up all the appointments because you can um, keep, keep everything intact and make sure that you're there on time. But all of a sudden, the person living with dementia might say, I don't have to go to the doctor. I'm not sick. Why do we have a doctor's appointment? So to accept that the person might not have insight to their inabilities and to their diagnosis is very important. Um, it, it can be frustrating for you as a caregiver, but you need to kind of put that emotion elsewhere uh, in your day um, so that you can move forward. Another thing you can do is learn and discover. So the more you learn about the disease, the easier it is to conceptualize actually what's happening to the brain. So we always at AGI stress the importance of education. Um, 
lectures like these, as well as uh, some of our workshops are crucial in making sense of it, what's happening to your loved one uh, at a given time. So as an example, some people think that uh, when someone's diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, that it's, uh, the person might experience short-term memory loss. But for any caregiver or family member, you might realize that it's much more than just memory. Understand why things are happening in the brain, that the person living with dementia is not doing things intentionally to make it hard for you. Because essentially this is hard for them as well. They're not able to do things or the same way that they might used to. The, the chemical and structural changes that are happening in their brain are not allowing them to be as successful as they once were. It's not in their control and it's not in your control other than the fact that you can learn more about the changes. So um, another example would be um, the person's impulse control. So in the front of the brain, as an example, um, is your frontal lobe and that deals with, it helps to, it helps to, uh, it controls your impulse uh, and pleasure seeking. So for example, if my frontal lobe is still intact and I want a cookie, I might say that, yes, I can have a cookie to myself, but I'm, logically I'm gonna wait until after dinner so I don't spoil my meal. A person um, where their frontal lobe is damaged in their brain, they might say that they would like a cookie, but then they might feel that they need the cookie and they need the cookie now and they can't do anything by getting that cookie. They can't focus on anything till they get that cookie in that moment. So it's very hard for caregivers how to react when you're dealing with the front of their brain that is damaged. Another thing that you can do um, is to create a dementia friendly environment. What do I mean by that? Well, you want to look at your surrounding, the physical surroundings, and see how can you simplify things a little bit. The more clutter that is around creates more confusion um, for their brain to understand how to maybe move their bodies, things that they want to get, making choices. So simplify the, simplify the physical surroundings. Um, also minimize distractions. So uh, you're someone who loves to have the music on or the TV on while you're cooking dinner and you're asking the person living with dementia for help, you might need to turn off that TV and that extra noise because the person's not able to concentrate as once were. Um, when you set things up, uh, what we tend to call as failure free, is that we might, for clothing for them to get, the person to get dressed, we might lay out their clothes, but they're still capable, we can assess the, of putting on their own clothes, but they know, or we might hand them their item of clothing one step at a time and be there to support them. Um, it's very important to create the environment um, dementia friendly based on the person's um, abilities because you can't control the person, but you can control how they maneuver things uh, throughout the environment. So this is very, very challenging um, for caregivers um, because change is so hard, especially at the beginning. Um, so very often uh, family members might um, take charge of planning and controlling everything because uh, they feel that it's the more that they control the less chance of something going wrong. Okay. As the disease progresses, the person living with dementia has increasingly more things taken away from them. They're, we talked about independence, um, their ability to make decisions. Friendships are taken away from them because people withdraw, they don't know how to interact with the person. Um, so if as a caregiver, you can kind of give up that control and let that person feel in control whenever possible, um, that 
that is one way of creating successful interactions. So um, offering them choices, what they would like um, for to do for that day, or maybe what they want to eat, asking them for opinions. So I, I think I think we should go outside because it's a nice day. What do you think? Now they might say, I don't know, or they might say, sure, sounds good. But you've actually had a dialogue with them rather than just telling them what you're going to do. Um, you want to tap into their brain and think about what they're still good at. So can they connect with music? Um, are they great at social chit chat? Um, setting them up for success uh, and even giving them information. So uh, another example is if you know that the neighbor came over to spend some time with um, uh, your spouse, rather than saying to them, so um, what did you what did you guys talk about or what did you do? One thing you could do to set it up for success is check in with your neighbor first, find out how the visit went, and then you can give them the information. So, hey, I heard that um, that you and Roger were telling lots of jokes and you were um, you laughed a lot and and reminisced about the days at school. So it's it's a way of feeding them those that information rather than putting them on the spot so they feel less than. You're, you're essentially empowering them um, to feel whole and complete. So this is very hard for caregivers as well. Um, very often, um, you want to try to focus on doing things with the person rather than to the person or for the person. So many caregivers feel like, oh, you know what, I'm just gonna do this because it's faster, they'll do it right, I'll do it right and we'll be done with it. Very often this is a thing for, for tasks. So for example, if a person wants to help, they, they have no activities and they say, can I help you or, or can I do that for folding laundry? Well, are they going to fold laundry the same way that you're used to? Are they going to, you know, re reposition things? Or are they um, the way that you want it to create? With the folds, will it fit in the drawer? So one, you have one choice or one way of thinking is you could just do it yourself and just say, no, I'm fine, thanks. Why don't you go watch TV? Or you can say, you know what, that would be so helpful. Thank you so much. Um, and maybe you can engage in a conversation saying, you know what, I've always hated to do laundry and I'm so happy that you're, you're here to do it. You're doing such a better job than I am. Now, I want you to pause for a second. What if they didn't do a good job? What if no one can do it the way that you like it done? I say, Say, so what? Um, it's really important to keep that person engaged and feeling fulfilled. And what's the worst that can happen? When they're in the other room, you can quickly, well, before putting away the laundry, you can refold it the way that you'd like it. Letting go of this control and doing things with, it's, it's really thinking of things a, as a partnership, um, thinking, tasks that might be mundane to you as activities, way of reconnecting with that person uh, and creating a meaningful moment. Set realistic expectations. Here's another one that's, that's very hard because when you're looking at the person living with dementia, they look like your spouse, they look like your friend, they look like your parent but they have, their brain is broken. Um, their brain is dying, essentially. Um, so very often, families tend to um, set the person up thinking that they're going to succeed, but essentially, they're not able to do things the same way. Um, they might get lost in the task. 
Um, they might need you to be by their side to, to help support them. Um, putting away groceries. You wanna ask them, they've been in the house for 25 years. They should know where the pantry is. They should know where they, they put things in the fridge versus in the cupboards. When you go back and you realize what they've done, can you get angry at them for, for doing it wrong? Well, no, because they are confused. They, they're disoriented to, to time and to, to place and where things go. Even if you have your cupboards labeled a certain way, they, they are focused on a task and if they get interrupted, they might not be able to complete that class, especially the way that you want them. Um, repetition, you know, even putting post-it notes or, or in around the house, reminding them, I've gone for groceries at the store, I will be back in an hour. Well, you might ex think that post-it notes would help someone, but if they're not in the room and they don't know what an hour, when the hour started, um, they're gonna call you and they're gonna keep calling you um, maybe every five minutes because that's just another symptom of the disease. So how do you deal with it? Well, you can tolerate it. You can tolerate the constant phone calls or the check-ins. Um, and two, you could uh, address the underlying need. So maybe they, they are feeling insecure because you are not around them and they need someone by their side. Um, look for triggers um, as to why they're calling well maybe it's because they there's a phone in every single room of the house and so when they see the phone and they see they're alone um, they're going to do the logical thing and pick up the phone and call um, increase predictability uh, of them doing it well if they've been doing it for the last month their chances are they're going to keep doing it uh, until you learn how to um, change the environment um, and keep your uh, expectations realistic. Um, being flexible is really challenging, but uh, once you learn how to go with the flow, um, you'll definitely see more successes. Um, let go of, of the conventional rules of life and, and not worry as much about outcomes. Um, prioritize on having fun. Uh, I think that this pandemic uh, has taught many of us is what's really important in life. Does it really matter um, that your house is, is clean a certain way or um, that you know you might not have had that gourmet meal you're used to because you're trying to work with whatever groceries you have? Be in the moment um, and try not to correct or criticize um, the person, rather congratulate them and thank them for doing such a good job. Now I'd like everyone just to take a deep breath for a second and realize how good that feels. We're so busy in our day to day that we don't breathe enough. When we don't breathe enough and we're stressed, we can't think straight. So rather when a person living with dementia does things that might not make sense to you in the moment. For example, getting up in the middle of the night, putting on their clothes and saying that they need to go to work, rather than, than yelling at them because you're half asleep saying, what are you talking about? You were tired 15 years ago. Um, you need to stop and just figure out why the person might be doing that. Take a deep breath if that's what you need and to get kind of your emotions down and respond. Now telling them, uh, reality orienting them, as I said, telling them that they retired um, isn't gonna help. Um, you'll probably just end up in a conflict. Um, but looking at and identifying what their needs are in the moment, um, is it because they're disoriented time, they need you to, to they, they need to feel productive, their clockwork uh, their, is off. Maybe they were trying to find the bathroom um, and instead of finding the bathroom, they are trying to leave the front door. It's 
really important that as much as you try not to react and you respond that later on you have a moment to kind of process of what's happening because that might be another setback a feeling of loss for you um, and that's important for you to acknowledge um, and really work through but realize that by validating the person um, responding to those unmet needs um, is more important um, and will get you uh, further when we do react the person is watching your body language the person is seeing whether you're angry or sad frustrated um, and then all of a sudden they feel like they've done something wrong but again going back they're not doing something on purpose they're they're just maybe confabulating they're trying to go with whatever their brain is telling them to do in that moment so forgive yourself forgiving yourself is something that uh, i stress for all families what's really challenging is that once you, you've realized a kind of a routine a strategy um, what works one day might not work the next day um, with this disease there's constant change it's constantly unpredictable um, which adds more stress for yourself um, so you need to slow down and reassess acknowledge that you are not perfect you're going to make mistakes um, you're going to have your good days and your bad days uh, you know you too if you didn't get a good night's sleep um, if you're feeling you're not your health is is threatened you're not feeling well you might be going through something you need to kind of take an oath to yourself to learn from each experience that happens um, recognize what your needs are uh, as a care partner and as a person in order to continue to do an amazing job like you're already doing um, Picking your battles is really important. Um, uh, realizing what might be risky uh, behavior and not risky behavior. So for example, um, is it risky behavior for the person to be going outside just around your house or is it a risky behavior for you to leave them alone for four hours where they can go and find themselves on a busy street um, is it um, risky behavior if um, the person wants to um, make a meal and they're using a butter knife to cut things, but they're feeling successful in whatever they're doing? Um, or is it more risky if they're using a sharp, um, you know, a culinary knife um, where they can really hurt themselves? Um, picking your battles and seeing what's really important to fight um, and then forgiving yourself if you feel like you haven't um, you responded a way that um, you're regretting um, it's a, a lot of guilt that caregivers go through and if you're trying to do things the best that you can with with the resources that you have then that's fantastic um, you you really need to acknowledge everything and how you've adapted throughout this whole process So taking care of yourself, um, we hear this often, you know, you hear the oxygen mask analogy where if you're caring for someone, you should put on your own uh, oxygen mask before helping the other person beside you. Um, making time for yourself is so important. And very often families will say to us, um, I have no time. I can't do this. People need me. My loved one needs me 24 seven. If you cannot make time for yourself, um, you need to reevaluate how that might be possible. Um, building a community around you um, is essential. No one can do it alone. Speaking to organize, community organizations, involving the CLSC, um speaking to your neighbors and friends 
this community is essentially your lifeline. And when you really need a break, um, you can count on people um, with education as to how your loved one is, um, what your loved one wants, and, and maybe problem solving as well. How do you recognize when you need a break? Um, this is really hard because you probably feel like even if you had a break for maybe an hour a day, um, you find yourself kind of being irritable um, as soon as you get back um, because you're faced to the same situation. Maybe what you need to do is create more smaller breaks either throughout the week um, some other people, they actually don't need the smaller breaks. They just need the goal to say, okay, this weekend I have the morning off to go and have coffee with my girlfriends. So figure out what works for yourself. Um, planning for the future um, can really be anxiety provoking for a lot of people. But we often will try to encourage families to have or caregivers to have a plan in place. Um, so that those what ifs, uh, what, what if I get sick? What if um, uh, there's no one to take care of my loved one? When you have kind of that it plan in place, um, it kind of will create some type of control and reassurance for yourselves that hopefully we don't have to use this plan, but it's there. Um, also, um, I would also say that um, when you're taking care of yourself, it's very easy to, to look at the past, um, to look at the future, uh, but what we have been doing is living in the moment and acknowledging um, that when you're in the moment, you know, without distractions, without um, all of the appointments that you have to go through or thinking ahead, um, you know, the phone calls, uh, you know, the bills to be paid when you're just in the moment, uh, you can really start to appreciate the person um, for what they can do. Maybe they just did something that made you laugh. Um, we often also say, what's your gratitude journal? Or journal? Um, write in it, uh, write three things that, that went really well today. Um, you can also even acknowledge something that went really bad and maybe how you can improve it. So um, you have to take care of yourself. You have to acknowledge your grief um, and then um, also move forward and don't forget yourself uh, in all of this because it's very easy to forget who you were before being a caregiver um, and still bringing those, those passions um, and those, those, that personality back because you don't want to lose yourself. So uh, I'm here for questions. Rennie, do you have anything? Sure, so thank you, Megan. We have a question in the chat already. What I'll do is um, I'll just uh, highlight where the chat is for anybody else who might want to submit some questions at this time. Um, so in just a moment, you'll see a message pop up. And you can just reply to that. You can click on the message that just popped up now. And if you want to send your messages there uh, with questions that you have, we welcome them. Um, so Megan, we had one question come in uh, during the lecture. And this one is about um, when you spoke about relinquishing control. Mm -hmm. um, so this person is sharing, she's saying, my husband is obsessed with food shopping, um, but it's dangerous to go on the bus and in stores in terms of COVID. So how do you deal with giving up the, letting the person feel in control and shopping? I actually, yeah. it, it, it sounds, uh, I saw a video uh, recently during COVID of what one family did. Now it's very creative, so it might be a little too creative for some people, but um, they actually set up kind of a grocery store um, <laughs> environment. So it might not be in that house, but it could be somewhere else, it, depending on where the person is at in the stage of dementia, um, that they set up so the person could still feel like they're shopping, um, but maybe not necessarily at a store um, that may or may not work. So the person was able to choose and put things in their bag. It depends on what aspect of the grocery shopping um, mm -hmm. is for this person. So when we're dealing with um, a pandemic, a lot of people, what is that need? Is it because 
Um, is this a new kind of behavior where they're feeling like um, there's not as much supply for food? Um, and so they're trying to maybe hoard. Um, is it because they really enjoy choosing um, the food in that sense? I would say right now, if there was a small store um, uh, where the person could go in a safe, safest way possible. There's no such thing as 100% safe during these times. Um, with the stores, if you go into a small store where you might know the owner, give them the Purell, um, social distancing. Uh, we always say for some people, it's really challenging um, for a person with cognitive impairments to social distance at this time to, to understand the rules. Um, and that's where education plays because um, people uh, in the community need to maybe stop, look and, and see without judging a person. Why is this person not social distancing? Why is the person responding a certain way? Um, you don't, dementia is not like you're wearing a cast, as I say. You don't know if someone has some type of cognitive impairment or even some mental illness. So um, with grocery shopping, I. I mean, I've seen it myself where you kind of just, you can only control yourself. So um, bringing the Purell, making sure that uh, wiping down the food afterwards. Um, and if it's a matter of having too much food in the house, well, maybe then you can kind of slowly shift where the food and hopefully buy things that you can freeze and things like that. So, so thank you, Megan. Um, we're just getting getting some questions in the chat uh, just so everybody knows I put it in the chat but you will after this be receiving an email with a recording of today's lecture um, as well as Megan's slides that you've been seeing up on the screen so you can hold on to that for the future um, and I'll just let me just see what else is coming in here in the chat um, we have a question about programming at AGI Megan maybe you can answer this um, Joy is saying my dad misses his group at AGI is there anything being planned outdoors or um, like a meetup in a park absolutely so uh, AGI we're not doing anything outdoors um, it was discussed uh, but there's so many different um, variables um, that uh, we need to focus on reopening um, our existing services in person in the activity center um, and focus on that. So what we have for the person living with dementia um, is uh, Zoom. Not everyone has access to a computer or Zoom, but the staff have even made phone calls, um, weekly phone calls to people living with dementia if they are able to hear and, and there's uh, no deficits there. Um, we are, it is a long process to reopen the activity center as an example. Um, and we wanna make sure the safety of any participants coming in as well as the staff. So I can say that a plan is being worked on, um, being discussed daily, um, and it will take a little bit of time to ensure that all the proper protocols are met. Uh, in the meantime, for anyone who needs support or um, how to support someone specifically related to a task, which I didn't really get into today. Um, you can always call AGI at the number uh, below, speak with a counselor, um, you can email us as well, and we can kind of problem solve based on your specific situation because everyone is different. And when people present certain situations to us, uh, very often counselors, we just have more questions for you to really explore and understand the situation. So. We have online support groups um, where even if you don't have access to um, to a Zoom, you can call in and use your phone. Um, and we have uh, training courses uh, coming up as well. I'm sure I missed something, Renny. <laughs> no, I think that's, that's great. I, I, I will just point out as we're getting to the end of the lecture today, you know, we do have one more question in the chat. If there are other questions that we're not able to get to or that come to you after the lecture, again, you're welcome to reach out and, and you can speak with a counselor one on one. If you don't already have a counselor that you're connected with, you're welcome to reach out by phone or, or by email and we will be happy to connect you with someone. Um, so Megan, just one more question in, in the chat. This is another COVID related question. Um, so this is from Linda. She is saying, 
that with COVID, um, she's given up taking, taking him outside, I presume, but she's feeling like he's not getting out enough and that's difficult. She says, my husband likes to pop into the hardware store, but he doesn't want to put on a mask or um, in, he gets argumentative about the social distancing. Um, she's saying he thinks that the COVID is, is being overdone. So I think, um, well, part of what the government says is people um, with cognitive impairments, they are actually part of that, um, those groups where they don't have to wear masks. Um, now, that being said, if you're going into a, a store, um, some of obviously the store manager and the employees might not recognize that that is actually uh, a reality that they don't have to wear masks. One thing I would probably do is I could, if it's a small, again, the, I always go to the smaller stores the better because, you know, people, they kind of watch the the, the social distancing a little bit, maybe um, calling the store manager saying, um, you know, my husband really wants to go to the hardware store. He has cognitive impairment. He's not going to wear a mask. Um, and is there a time of day that would be best for to do this? Um, uh, and is it going to bother the staff? How do we be respectful of, of everyone around? Um, you'd be surprised. Um, I do know of some people who with cognitive impairments have worn masks, um, but it, it is challenging not understanding, feeling like why should I? Like, I don't have the virus. I'm not sick. So like, I can do what I want. Um, you know, maybe depending on the person, is it enough just to go online and do some shopping online? Um, probably not because a lot of people like to see and, and, and with all the nuts and bolts and things like that. So try, try to, again, control the environment knowing how your husband is and uh, maybe again some smaller stores might um, be more open to that okay. um megan if if you feel we have time for it we have a sort of follow-up question on, on can, this topic yeah that's fine when um you... so this is margaret who um had submitted the the sort of the first question regarding covid and she's saying you know similar to the question that was just asked. Um, her husband doesn't understand the seriousness of the situation and she finds that he's rushing into the store, um, is argumentative with her and just wanting to find bargains. <laughs> Don't we all. Don't we all, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, and, and what to do, I guess, Renny? Yeah, that? yeah, how to respond to that. I about the, the bargains and, and rushing in you know, yeah. even without covid people were doing that um and you'd have a lot of looks around you i think that um you know what would be better if he doesn't wear a mask would he wear a visor um covid is a really challenging time for everyone, but especially for those who really don't understand what's happening or their, their surroundings. Um, not, you know, not allowing them to do something, again, uh, is there a different place where they can go? Um, is there something else that will fulfill their need? Maybe they can do, look through the, the flyers first and just say, you know what, now we need appointments for the grocery store. Um, it's we can problem solve have her call AGI mm -hmm. maybe there's another way that we can uh, address that maybe there's another need that can be met like that's comparable right that's not necessarily um, mm -hmm. but in the end of the day having an argument and fighting about it sometimes you have to let it go sometimes sometimes it can't come from you as a caregiver it's better to come from maybe the store manager um, and, and it's kind of like the driving rather than telling the person that they shouldn't be driving anymore, have the physician tell the person that they should be driving. So you feel like you're supporting the person mm -hmm. um, and guiding that person um, in, in their, their beliefs. 
Absolutely. So again, as Megan said, these types of situations, it's often really helpful if you can speak to a counselor one on one, we can, you know, get a bigger picture about what's going on and, and try to make some more specific suggestions. So again, our contact information is on the screen. Um, I just like to point out as well, there was a there was a comment in the chat about the online support group. The best way to learn more about that is if you again, give us a call and one of our counselors can speak with you. Um, when somebody wants to join a support group, we always like to to get to know them first and, and welcome them. So give us a call if you're interested and we can speak with you more about what kind of spaces are available and what groups at, at what times. Um, so that's what I'd recommend. Um, I'm also just seeing a, a nice suggestion here from Janie. She is saying Steve's hardware store in Point Claire shopping center at the corner of St. John and Highway 20 is a nice small store and friendly concerned staff and that might be a possible location to go to. So thank you very yeah. much for that suggestion. Um, so again, as I said before, you will be getting a, an email. Keep an eye on your emails. Um, the email will have a recording of today's lecture as well as the slides that you've been seeing today. And it will also have a survey regarding today's lecture. We would really appreciate if you can fill that out for us. It will give you an opportunity to give your input about what kind of topics you'd like to see us present on in future lectures. Um, and your feedback on how this went is always, always appreciated. You know, like everyone else, we've just gotten started doing this online and we're always happy to hear your thoughts about it. So thank you for joining today. Um, again, please, we welcome you to be in touch with us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you hopefully at more events like this in the future. Thank you. Thank you.